Good morning. Good to have you with us again today. We're stepping into a, a chapter today and a subject that raises a lot of questions, uh, has a lot of interest. We are in Revelation chapter 13. We're going to be looking at the Antichrist today. Who is he is the question that comes up. When is he going to come? Is he here now? Uh, is he Jew? Is he Gentile? What's it going to be like? All kind of questions that we have. If he's here now, who is he? It seems like every generation is trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. And if he's in our generation now, they're always trying to guess who is the Antichrist. So many political and famous names have been attached to the name of Antichrist. In my generation, the gen generations before us, and it's, it's, it creates so much curiosity. Well, it's an important subject. We're going to look at it this morning. We're not going to answer all your questions, but we'll try to give us a summary view of what the Scripture so shows to us, reveals to us. We're going to be focused here in Revelation 13, but we're going to be looking at other, other passages and other texts as well. So let's dive right in. Let's see what the, what the Lord has for us. John makes it very clear, the one who wrote the book of Revelation. He also wrote 1 John, the epistle. He says, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. He makes no bones about it. In fact, the word Antichrist is only used four times in the scriptures, that particular word. And John is the only one that uses it. There are other designations and other names for the Antichrist, but John is the one who writes most about it, and he writes about it in this epistle. I want us to look at the Antichrist basically from two elements of the tribulation. And as we do that, we're going to look at the different various pieces and phases and uh, uh, markers of the Antichrist together. Let's learn, let's, let's grow, and uh, let's, let's adapt uh, our hearts towards the Word of God and what He has for us. Let's look at the first half of the tribulation. What we do know is that the church is going to be raptured. We see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's clear as Paul writes and as the scripture unfolds that the Lord is going to, is going to take the church and rapture the church to be with Him. Those who are alive, um, those who are dead in Christ will rise first. Those who are alive will, will come afterwards. will meet the Lord in the cloud to be with Him forever in the air. And so the church is going to be raptured. When that occurs, then the tribulation is going to begin. The Holy Spirit, we believe, is going to be removed as far as controlling evil on this earth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. You know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. We believe the Holy Spirit will remove his, his hands of control over evil and let evil run wild and let evil run rampant and that's when the holy spirit or that's when the antichrist will also be revealed after the rapture the holy spirit will remove his hands and at that time the antichrist will also be revealed to the world second thessalonians shows us this picture that he will be revealed he says here paul says to the believers there the rapture hasn't occurred yet the day of the lord hasn't occurred yet because many had been taught and people were telling them that it had already occurred he says no it hasn't occurred yet he says that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Here he's referring to the Antichrist. He says, when that man is revealed, then you know that the tribulation is here, the day of the Lord is here. There's, the day of the Lord is applied in many ways. Here it's being used in the sense of the tribulation. So when will he be revealed? We believe, I believe, we're gonna see him, we see him at the very beginning of the tribulation. When Jesus opens those seals, that very first seal, Revelation 6, look, I behold, there was a white horse, and its rider had a bow. A crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. What's missing here is the arrows that go with it. It seems that this rider, some have said this is Jesus Christ, some have said it's another, but we've looked at it earlier, and it seems like the evidence points us towards the fact that this is the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is going to come onto the scene. He's not going to come on as a military conqueror. He's going to come on as a... As a, as a uh, political conqueror as uh, one who has answers to the world's problems and he's going to conquer he's going to consolidate he's going to he's going to he's going to coalesce nations around him because of his ability to handle the issues and the chaos that has happened because of the rapture and what's taking place i believe he's going to be a gentile that's that's a big question jew or gentile daniel chapter 7 verse 3 and four great beasts came up out of the sea different from one another we see this, and we'll see this in Revelation 13 here, verse 1 as well. He comes up out of the sea. When we look in the scripture, that term is, is always understood by the Jews 
as as Gentile nations. Uh, the Jews always had a, a, a terrifying uh, view of the seas beyond them. They never had a navy except under King Solomon, and and then he hired the navy to work for him. They never were big on the water. They were terrified of the water in that sense, and it always represented the dangers that were out there and of the Gentile nations. Uh, we're going to see other reasons why I believe Scripture shows us this is a Gentile, not a Jew. This is a significant one because the seas are always tied to the element of Gentile nations. He will unite nations together, ten nations or ten regions, probably ten nations. After this, I saw in the night visions a fourth beast. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. or four beasts that are here in chapter 7 of Daniel and also in chapter 2 from different perspectives. And we see here this last beast that had it had ten horns that signifies ten kings, ten nations, ten entities, and uh, and so the the antichrist is going to is going to the beast is going to draw these nations together into a, a, a confederation of nations. We see that here in Revelation 13, our very first verse. And I saw a beast again, what rising out of the sea, with ten horns and seven heads and ten diadems on its horns. Ten crowns on its on its horns, and so it's picturing here his dominion over nations and over kingdoms. We have ten horns and seven heads. We're going to see the significance of that in just a second. Um, and so and so we see his his um, his power, uh, the majesty, majesty that will be given to him, the the control that will be given to him over nations, and he will immediately um, begin to have impact in this world as a leader. Who will be drawing nations together. Daniel chapter 7 shows us that he'll come out of nowhere, really. Chapter 7, verse 8, he says, I considered these ten horns, which is in verse 7, and behold, there came up among them uh, another horn, a little one, which before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. We believe that's referring to, to the Antichrist here. Here he is, again, over this confederation of ten nations, ten horns. It said, remember, there were ten horns and ten crowns, but there were seven heads. That comes, that comes from here, the scriptures. It seems that he will come on in the scene, and as he comes up out of nowhere, one of the things that will be the result of his coming to prominence and to power will be he will uproot three of these nations. And so that's why you have the ten and you have the seven. And he will uproot these nations for whatever reasons we don't know. Um, lack of willingness to follow after him. Um, he will uproot them. And, and that ten, nation of Contan will become a, a confederation of seven nations, which he will control. He will be deceitful in every way, but he will be a peacemaker. The scriptures, we see that in the first seal. He'll be on a white horse. Uh, he will come bringing a peace, at least the appearance of peace. Um, again, the world's going to be filled with chaos, folks. There's going to be so much going on when the rapture occurs. The world's going to be in enough evil. And it's going to take time for a leader to bring this peace to the world and to grab, grab a hold of the reins and, and grab leadership. We see in Jan Daniel chapter 11, verse 21, in, in his place, and this chapter refers to uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, a, this, was a, this was a king from 175 to 164, a king uh, over a portion of Syria. He, he becomes, in Scripture, he becomes a symbol of the Antichrist. He becomes a prototype of the Antichrist. He's a picture of what the Antichrist will be like. And so this, this chapter is split up into a, a description of him and then a description, ultimately, of the Antichrist that we see here in this chapter as well. And this, in this section, if there's talking about this king, what he is, the Antichrist will also be. And it says here that he will obtain his kingdom by, by flattery. Uh, he will be uh, intrigue and uh, the use of his of his mouth and tongue, um, and he will speak in, in double tongued. <laughs> That's what he'll do, and he will gain the, the the allegiance of political leaders around him because of the smooth ability to talk. And yet behind that is a wickedness and a, and a heart and an intent to destroy and to hurt. And that's what's going to be deceived, seen. But initially he is he comes on the scene as a peacemaker, and you know what. The world's going to be looking for that. The world's going to be looking for peace in the midst of chaos. The world's going to be looking for solutions and for answers to the to the Israel-Arab conflict, to the to the economic chaos, to all the things that have been taking place. And he's going to come on the scene. He's going to be an, he's going to be an answer maker. 
he's gonna he's gonna uh, he's gonna be able to bring a seven year covenant into this world with many nations. Daniel nine twenty seven. He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. The many isn't identified here, but it tells us it be many nations are going to be a part of the seven year covenant. We do know as well from verse twenty four because the context of this verse. 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. This covenant specifically includes and is for Israel as well. Because these 70 weeks are geared towards Israel specifically in which the promise of this covenant is made. So the Antichrist is going to, is going to be a peacemaker. He's going to make peace in this world with, with many nations. And Israel is going to be a part of that. So in that, in that peace pact that is made, Israel is going to be protected. The Antichrist, the beast, is going to have ulterior motives. Uh, he's going to have motives that are destructive, but he's, he's going to hide those motives. Israel is going, to, is going to feel like they are able to make that covenant, and they will be at peace uh, for a time. That's what Israel has always sought, is to be at peace with the nations and the world around it. And he will make that happen, because God allows it. What man will see as they look at him and look, look at this man, the Antichrist, is charisma, is power. About the ten horns, it says that were on his head. Another horn came up. That's him in the midst of these ten horns. There's a little horn that comes up. Daniel says, gives us a description. And before which three of them fell, which we saw that, the ten and the three. And the horn had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things. And it seemed greater than its companions. See, it's it's impressive in every way. It comes it comes out of nowhere. Um, it is filled with charisma. It is filled with power. He's going to come on the scene. He's going to be this individual. He's going to draw nations and people to himself. He's going to have the answers. He's going to have solutions. Uh, he's going to have vision. Uh, he's going to cut through all the dilemmas that have that have uh, prevented solutions from happening in the world. He's going to be a solution maker. He's going to be a peacemaker. That's what the world's going to see. God has a different view. We see that here in verse 13. He calls him a beast. He's a beast, and not only that, he has blasphemous names on his, on his heads. As the Lord looks at him, as Jesus Christ looks at him, he knows exactly who he is. He is a beast, and he is nothing but blasphemous. He will hide that in the beginning. It will come out in every way. And it will be seen as he as he leads and takes the world through the tribulation years. You know, it's it's a it's a terrible thing here, what he will do and what he will accomplish. He will hide his intentions, but in the end, it will be the most destructive thing that has ever happened in this world. Prophecy is being fulfilled. God has promised. He has shown us what's going to take place. In Daniel seven, we see this as he describes four kingdoms that are coming. Daniel seven. Again, we also see that in Daniel two. The first kingdom was like a lion, the second like a bear, uh, the third was like a leopard, the fourth beast was terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. We understood and scholars understood these descriptions to be referring to Babylon, uh, the Medes and the Persians, to Greece, and then ultimately and finally to Rome. It's clear as we look at the scripture and study the context and see what's going on here. Um, it was different from all the other beasts. It had 10 horns. And then there was a little one that came up. That little one comes up, and it's the Antichrist. So Daniel gives us a, this picture of these kingdoms. And a final kingdom, this final fourth kingdom, is going to be the worst of all. And again, we see this in verse 2 of chapter of 13 of Revelation. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. See, here we go. So, so John gives a description, these same four that Daniel gives a description of. He looks at it from the past. They've already occurred, so his order is just reverse. Daniel looks at these kingdoms as they are coming, but they're the same four kingdoms that we see here. And here's the distinction that we see. And to it, this, this, this last kingdom, and to it the dragon gave its power and his throne and great authority. That's what we see taking place. So the dragon we saw last week is Satan, none other than Satan. Satan. Satan's going to give the Antichrist his power. He's going to give him his throne. He's going to give him his authority. He's going to operate under all of those things. That's what he's going to do. In fact, we see here at the end of chapter 12, this last phrase, it really should be the first verse of, of chapter 13. And so after all these things happen, Satan's thrown down to earth, and he stood on the sand of the sea. Some translations have, and I stood on the sand of the sea, referring to John. The oldest manuscripts, the most reliable manuscripts, uh, use the word he. Those are the ones that we trust. They're the oldest ones. 
and it refers to Satan. Satan's been thrown out of heaven. He takes his ultimate stand on the earth, and he will stand against the Lord and fight him to the very end. And so as his wrath is now poured out on earth, he gives his power, he gives his throne, he gives his authority to the Antichrist, who will, who will serve him and bring the allegiance of the world to him. That's what he's always wanted. Now, as he's acquiring power, as he's a peacemaker and, and, and forming a confederation of nations, he's beginning to take control of this earth. Remember, it's going to take time for him to do all this. As we understand the Antichrist, we see the Antichrist and we think all dominion and all power. His, his ability to have all dominion and all power will not happen until the second part of the tribulation. He's going to be coming on the scene. He's going to be acquiring. He's going to be, he's going to be building this confederacy of, of nations. He's going, to be, he's going to be fending off nations who will seek to uprise and usurp against him. He's going to be doing all that in those first three and a half years of the tribulation. While this is all going on, there's another element that's going on, I believe. And we have two witnesses here. We look at them in chapter 11. We have the two witnesses that are going to prophesy for 1,260 days. I believe they're going to be in the first half of the tribulation because they're here the same amount of time. They're here a half of the tribulation. The Antichrist is in full power a half of the tribulation. If you put them in the same half, the second half, it doesn't fit. The way the narrative ends, it doesn't fit. If you put the two witnesses and the Antichrist together in the second half, it doesn't fit how it ends. It doesn't fit with the second coming. We looked at that specifically. I believe they're going to be in the first half of the tribulation, these two witnesses. They are ministering. They are in power. They have the protection of God. They're invincible here for a time during this first half of the tribulation while the Antichrist is acquiring his power and gaining the allegiance ultimately of leaders in the worlds. Because of their witness, we have, we have 144,000 Jews who are saved. They are, they are sealed to serve God here in chapter 7. He's God seals the servants of them, of God, 144,000 specifically from the 12 tribes of Israel. The result of their being saved is, is that multitudes are saved around the world. Chapter 7, verse 9, a great multitude is saved from no number, no one could number. Every nation, every tribe, people, languages, they're standing before the throne, before the Lamb. They're clothed in white robes. robes. They are worshiping Jesus Christ. So while the Antichrist is acquiring power, he's made this covenant. The two witnesses are very, I believe, instrumental in protecting Israel during this time and allowing the temple to be built um, and overseeing and, and so that the Antichrist cannot do what he wants to do against Israel. In this, in this first half of the tribulation, the Antichrist is fuming uh, because his desire ultimately is to destroy Israel. And so it comes to a head here in the, in the, towards the end of the first half of the tribulation, at the end of the first half, as we move into the second half of the tribulation, God will allow the two witnesses to be killed. When they had finished their testimony, see, that's the key. They will, they will be here uh, three and a half years. At the end of that time, then the beast will rise up under the power of Satan himself, and he will be allowed to destroy and to take the lives of these two witnesses. The beast, when they finish their testimony, the beast... Now, that is always a reference to the Antichrist here in Revelation. The beast that rises from the bottomless pit, that's his power source, will make war on them, these two witnesses, and conquer them and kill them. And we've seen earlier, we saw what happened. They raised from the dead under God's power, and they are lifted up to heaven. But this is the beginning of when Antichrist consolidates his power. Now we're moving into the second half of the tribulation. And so that's where we find ourselves as we think about the ministry not the ministry, the, 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 the leadership of the Antichrist, now, now he comes to full power. So we have three and a half years. In verse 5, the beast, it was allowed, it was allowed. Who's allowing him? It's God. It was allowed, he was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. That's three and a half years. So as the second half of the tribulation comes to fruition and begins, the Antichrist is given the ability to have dominion over all the earth. So there's going to be a shocking event. There's going to be a miracle that takes place. Um, it seems as, as that second half begins, verses 3 and 4 here of Revelation 13, one of its heads, of its ten heads, seemed to have a mortal wound, and its mortal wound was healed. And, the, and so we have that reality here. And the whole earth marveled, and they followed the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast 
saying, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? See, there's no one left to fight against the beast. If the two witnesses are here in the second half of the tribulation, they are actively enabled to fight against the beast. They're able to do the same things that the beast is able to do. This question now the world is asking, because these two, I believe the two witnesses are now off the scene. They've had their ministry. They've had their impact. It is continuing. People are being saved. But God has allowed them now to be taken home. And now, now the Antichrist, as it were, is, with, is um, without someone to push back, as it were. He is, he is in supreme control. Now what happens here is it appears, it says, one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound. And so it appears to the world that the Antichrist is killed. Now we're going to see later in verse 13, not today, but next week, it's by the sword. He, he appears to be killed, to be slain. It's, it's going to look to the world like he, had, he receives a fatal wound, a mortal wound, and is killed. And, and he's going to come back to life. And he's going to astonish the world. And it's going to appear to be a resurrection of, of, of this man who was killed and then raises back from the dead. Now some say what happens here, it's, the, it's one of the heads, it's political. It, it is ultimately maybe Rome that, that was destroyed uh, in John's time. And then it, it's revived here in the in the tribulation, and it astonishes the world that Rome has actually made it back. And it could be that, but but because of the specific information that we see in the later verses, it seems that it's speaking of of this individual man who who is appears to die. It'll be a, it'll be a, a fake death. It'll it'll be it'll be done for the purpose of acquiring the allegiance of the world. It'll be fake. It won't be real. It seems as though he dies. It'll be it'll be a trick, but it will appear to be a miracle, and it will it will draw the allegiance of the world around the Antichrist. It'll be a clear defining moment. Verse eleven of chapter seventeen we see here in Revelation. As for the beast that was, and is not, it is an eighth, but it belonged to the seven that goes to destruction. Now there's context there, right? Um, so we believe that there that. There's four kingdoms in Daniel 7 and Daniel 2. But there's a reference also to, to here in, in, in Revelation to, to eight kingdoms. We don't know exactly what they are. They could be, it could be Egypt and Assyria and, and Babylon and the Medes and the Persians. It could be uh, Greece. It could be Rome. Then the revived Roman Empire. And so, and so the beast was and then is not. It refers to his fatal wound. And then he comes back. And so he was, he was a part of the seventh kingdom. Um, but then he dies, dies, and then he comes back and now leads a new kingdom, which is, according to John, the eighth kingdom. What he's going to do, he's going to come to power. What's going to happen? What's going to take place? Is he's going to break the seven-year covenant. He's going, to, he's, going to, he's going to come out and break this covenant that he made with the world. He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. That's a promise. And for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. He's going to break that covenant with, with many nations, but he's going to break that covenant with Israel. The focus of his break is going to be this. He's going to come to the temple there in Jerusalem. He's going to desecrate that temple, just as Antiochus Epiphanes did in Daniel chapter 11. And that's when, that's when Israel is going to know that he is false. That's when Israel is going to know that he is not their friend. He is their predator. That's when Israel is going to know that he is nothing but destruction. He's going to break that covenant, and everything's going to change. This is what we call from Daniel the abomination of desolation, chapter 9, verse 27. On the wing of abominations, that's what he will do. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, we saw this. Jesus says, to Israel, when you see this abomination of desolation, you're to run for your lives. It doesn't matter what you're doing at that moment. When you see that take place, you run. You don't take all this stuff with you. You don't, you don't pack your U-Haul and go. You run. You just run because it's changed. The game has changed, and now you are being pursued, and that's exactly what he's going to do. In Second Thessalonians, we also see this too. He will take his seat in the temple of God, and he will proclaim himself to be God. The Jews will, will reject him. They will run for their lives. Everything changes. Daniel chapter 8, verse 25, he will unleash destruction on the world. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper. That's what he's done the first three and a half years. Under his hand and in his own mind, he shall become great. And without warning, he shall destroy many. 
and he shall ri even rise up against the prince of princes, God himself. That's what he's going to do. And his destruction in this world will be swift, and it will be worldwide, and it will be focused specifically on Christians, on Israel itself, and on any who will not accept his allegiance and worship him. He will display an utter contempt for God. Verse 6 of chapter 13 here in Revelation. He opened his mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, and that is those who dwell on the earth. He's going to be, as it were, he's going to be in God's face. That's what he's going to do. Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. This is In this chapter, this is where it specifically turns from not just talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, but specifically, we believe, about Antichrist himself. And the king shall do as he wills, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. He shall speak astonishing things against the God of gods, and he shall prosper until the indignation is accomplished, until God says it's the end, for what is decreed shall be done. God's going to allow him to do this until the end. He will disregard all religion, Daniel eleven thirty seven. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers. He's going to throw out all the other gods or to the ones beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. Now that phrase, beloved by woman, it could mean he's not going to, he's not going to, he could care less about, about the people, about who the women are drawn to, the cause that they're drawn to. In this context, it would be other gods that they're drawn to, other causes. Or it could be a reference to the fact that uh, it could be describing a character quality of him, that he'll be, uh, he'll be homosexual, he'll be asexual. Um, but in this context, it seems like what he's speaking of is simply th this religious element in nature. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter who the world idolizes. It doesn't matter who they've been following. He will reject all of that. He will proclaim himself and magnify himself above everyone, above every God. That's what he will do. And the scriptures are very clear that's what he's going to do. He will destroy all other worship. Now, we're not there yet. We're going to get to Romans chapter 17, or Revelation 17. The ten horns that you saw, they and the beast, there's two entities here. You have the beast and you have the prostitute. We're going to describe them and talk about them when we get there. They will hate her now. They have worked with her for three and a half years. They have, they have helped build her power. They have, they have worked with her. They will turn on her. They will make her desolate, naked, devour her of flesh, and burn her up with fire. That's just descriptive terms to say they will turn on religion. Religion has had, uh, religion has had sway in this world. There will, be, there will basically be a, a religious leader in the world, and he will turn on her and destroy her. He wants, he wants no competition. He wants no other entity. He wants the world to worship him and only him and no one else. It doesn't matter what religion it is, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, anything, it doesn't matter. He will demand that all of the world worship him, bow down to him, and, and follow only him. He will make himself God, and he will demand worship. 2 Thessalonians 2.4 He will pose and exalt himself against every so-called God, or object of worship. He will proclaim himself to be God. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25 shows us he will relentlessly pursue Christians. He shall speak words against the Most High. And he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. For three and a half years, he will now pursue them and do everything in his power to destroy every man, woman, and child on this earth who is a Christian. Every Israelite who is a Christian. Now we've seen earlier, we saw earlier as we looked at this in, in chapter 12, that as he pursues Israel, God's going to protect Israel. And so in frustration, he will then turn his wrath from Israel, even though he will continue to pursue her. He will now pour his full wrath on Christians and anyone who claims the name of Jesus Christ. The, the penalty for being a Christian will be a capital offense. It will be death, no questions. Daniel chapter 8, verse 24. And his power shall be great, but not by his own power. He shall cause fearful destruction. He will succeed in what he does. He will destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. Imagine what power God has allowed him to have. To, to wield here. He will be successful in what he's doing. And it will be demonic power. Remember, all the demons, I believe, that were held in captivity have been released 
as parts of the judgment of God against men. Satan has been thrown out of heaven. All the demons have been thrown out of heaven in, in the previous chapter. Now we have all the demons, Satan himself, on earth. Folks, the demonic, satanic destruction that will take place under the leadership now of the Antichrist who will be following Satan himself, who will be embodied by Satan himself. Satan, I believe, will embody him, control him, be in him, just as he entered into Judas Iscariot. He will enter into the Antichrist, and he will simply lead the Antichrist in, in ultimate destruction of this earth. The Antichrist will simply embody the spirit of Antichrist that we're warned of now today in the Scriptures. Jesus says false Christs and false prophets. Well, in the Revelation, we're going to have a false Christ and we're going to have a false prophet. Will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, even if possible, the elect. The world's going to be deceived. The coming of the lawless one and the Antichrist is by the activity of Satan. With all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing unbelievers will be deceived about who he is and they will follow him out of belief or out of necessity but they will follow after him they will be brought to the conclusion that the only choice they have is to follow him in the midst of god's judgment of god's wrath they will come to the conclusion that the only choice they have the only path they have is to follow the antichrist because why because they refused to love the truth and so to be saved the word of god is available the word of god is being proclaimed in this world very visibly it has been in the first half of the tribulation it will continue to be proclaimed supernaturally in god's way but they will refuse the truth they will refuse the truth of god's message and of the gospel they will be deceived the world will be condemned therefore god will send them a strong delusion so that they will believe as they may believe what is false in order that they will be condemned here's why because they did not believe the truth, but they had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see, the world has, has continued stubbornly, obstinately, obstinately in this path. A refusal to believe God's word, a refusal to believe the need for the gospel, a refusal to believe the truth, a complete dedication to live their life however they want to do, to do what they want, when they want. Because of that, God will turn them over and send a delusion among them so that they cannot believe. Folks, that is terrifying. God will respond to their unbelief and cover their eyes so they can't believe. Will people still be saved? Yes. But the world at large will be prevented because of their unbelief. The unbelief first. He will dominate the world. He was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe, verse 7, and people, and language, and tongue. There's not a people group. There's not a location, geographical location on earth that he will not have dominion over. He will be in dominion over the earth. God will be protecting Israel as they flee. God will be protecting even individual believers, but individual believers will be slaughtered during the tribulation. Christians will not be wiped out 100%. Israel will not be wiped out 100%. We saw last week from Zephaniah that two-thirds of Israel is going to be killed. One-third will be preserved. They will be purified. They will be revealed as ones who were authentic before Jesus Christ. They will receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. But his destruction is going to be beyond terrible. It's going to be the worst time of Holocaust and, and execution that this world has ever seen. And you add on top of that the judgments of God on this earth. And the war that's taking place during the tribulation and, and the pursuit of the Antichrist against Christians, it's nothing but death after death after death after death. It's very sobering. And the world will yield to him. Verse 8, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name was not written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain, the Lamb's book of life. Everyone who is not a child of God will receive the Antichrist and give him worship. This is the end. This is a terrible thing. There's other elements we're not looking at yet. We're gonna Next week, we're going to look at the false prophet. We're going to look more at what the Antichrist does. We're going to see more. We're not done. But it's just a picture of the brutality of, of the two sides of the Antichrist. His, his 
his flattery, his charisma, his power in the first half, his ability to bring nations together, to, to coalesce nations together around world solutions. And then in the second half, and to make a covenant, to bring a, a, a semblance of peace in this world. And he's going to turn all of that upside down. And he will bring absolute destruction in this world. And he will turn nation against nation. And he will pursue Christians wherever they are and go after them. I want you to remember the end. Chapter 19, verse 20. The beast is captured. And with it, the false prophet. And these two are thrown alive into the lake of fire. Folks, there's an end coming. But his reign will be brutal. He will epitomize, he will epitomize the, the, the most evil, the worst elements of all the empires and nations and empires that have gone before him. That we see in the scripture and have seen in the world. He will be, he will be Hitler exponentially. He will be Genghis Khan exponentially. He will be as brutal and more brutal than the, than the Babylonians, than Rome, than Greece, than the Medes and the Persians. He will coalesce all of their worst attributes into one. Folks, he's going to be the worst. He will be brutal in ways that this world has never seen. But he will be defeated. What about today? We're not going through the tribulation. I trust you know Jesus Christ as Savior. I want to remind you, if I'm not a child of God, if you're not a child of God, if the rapture occurs, and if it happens this week, if it happens today, these things become current events. This steps, in, then this, this steps into a timetable that leads us right into the tribulation. And it will be the experience of your life to experience these things. It's a terrible thing. And then what choice you will make concerning Christ is not guaranteed. Now is the time to make that choice. Now is the time to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. So what about today? Well, First John, again, speaks of the Antichrist. He is coming. We see that. Children, it is the last hour, as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. And many Antichrists have come. There's the Antichrist, and then there are Antichrists. We're going to see that here. John's writing to churches in his time. He's writing to the church today before the rapture occurs. And he's, he's saying that there's an element of Antichrist now, but it's not the Antichrist that we've just talked about. And yet the spirit of Antichrist, the evil that he will that he will embody, the evil that he will that will become his is, is still at work in the world today. Chapter 4, verse 3, John says this. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming. And now it is in the world already. He says, you know what? The hour is coming. I'll tell you what, John anticipated it any time. It's been over 2,000 years. We still anticipate it any time. As we look, as we look at current events, as we look at the scriptures, we look at what the scriptures say. It becomes clear that the coming of the Lord is near. Every generation has believed that, and now we're seeing. And now we're seeing in culture. And now we're seeing. Now we're seeing in the world just elements of it being so close, folks. I hope you're ready. The spirit of the Antichrist is evil has impacted churches throughout history, and the world. He says in chapter two, verse nineteen. They, these antichrists, these evil, what they, they went out from us, but they were not of us. They're gonna they're gonna have been in they're gonna have been among the truth. They will have learned the truth. Many who have who are who are now opposed to God, many who now have lifestyles that are in disobedience to God, many who have turned against the Lord were at one time exposed to the truth of God's word, but it didn't ultimately touch their heart. He says, if they had been of us, if it had been genuine, they would have continued with us, but they went out. And it became plain they were not of us. That spirit of Antichrist, that spirit of rejection, of not embracing Jesus Christ and the identity of Christ for their life. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith. They will devote themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons. See, that they will have been around faith, around Christianity, around church, around the Bible, and they were rejected. And they will have their own reasons. Oh, church is hypocrites, or it, I don't believe in hell, or I, or I don't believe if a God is loving, he would allow evil. And so many questions that we have, and that will become, that will become the, the passion of their life. It will, the disappointment will lead them away from. It will reveal that that faith, genuine faith, was never there. They will deny Jesus Christ as the answer for their life. John says, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. This is the real Antichrist, but this is also the spirit of Antichrist today. He is the one who denies the Father and the Son. Not just the existence of the Father and the Son, but the authority of the Father and the Son. That Jesus is the answer to our life. That he is the one that, that we are to give our life to. 
that he is the savior that we need, that he is the provision that we need, they will reject that. It will deny the deity of Jesus Christ. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming. Now is in the world today. They reject him. If you want to know where someone stands in relation to Jesus Christ, just ask him who Jesus Christ is. Scripture teaches he is the son of God. He is also the son of man, fully God and fully flesh, without sin. He came to save, seeking to save those who were lost. He provided that with his own life on the cross. Deception is real. Many deceivers, 2 John verse 7, have gone out into the world. Those who did not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is a deceiver and the Antichrist. Deception is real. You and I need to be sure of where we stand. We need to be sure of what we believe. We need to be grounded in God's word. You and I need to know who Jesus Christ is because the day is coming where we're going to have to, we're going to, have to answer for him. We're going to have to have an answer to a culture that's always asking. We're going to have to have an answer for, for a culture that looks at us now and says, you're not only weird, you're a danger. You're a danger to our culture. Because of what you believe and how you believe and how you function, you're dangerous. You're not one of us. We don't like you. And we don't think you should be around. Things are changing for Christians today. We're going to have to make a choice. First John chapter 5, what is your choice? Those who have the spirit of the Antichrist, they're from the world. They listen to the world. They follow after the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. They're at one with the world. An unbeliever embraces what the world has to say, and that is their message. We, we, we pick up the worldview of the world around us, and we embrace it. That becomes ours. That's an unbeliever. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. But this we know that the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, it comes down to will you receive the truth of God's, God's word or will you receive the error of the teachings of this world? It comes down to will you receive Jesus Christ as Savior or reject that information, that truth of who he is and receive the message of this world and be separated from Christ for all eternity? It comes down to a choice. Jesus Christ or my way. Jesus Christ or the way of the world. There is a distinction. I want you to see that distinction. It's so clear here in Revelation. We're not here, but we still have to make a choice that's as equally as powerful today. Our life might not be in danger, but there will be a cost. There will be a sacrifice for following after Jesus Christ. Oops, sorry. We see here in Revelation 13, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. See, in Revelation, the believers, by receiving Jesus Christ, it will lead them to this place. Be taken captive, lose their life. That's, that's the result of receiving Jesus Christ in the tribulation. He reminds us, but here's the call. For in the endurance and the faith of the saints. It's never been it's never been any different. In all the Old Testament, New Testament, it's never been any different. For genuine believers to endure faithfully in this world under the adversity, trials, and tribulation that we're presented with. To endure faithfully for the sake of Jesus Christ. To stay strong, to be committed to the faith of Jesus Christ, the faith of the Word of God. You and I have a choice to make every day. Will I be committed to Christ? Will I endure for him? Will I be committed to following after Jesus Christ, being an ambassador for Jesus Christ, being a living letter for Jesus Christ, no matter the cost? It's going to be worth it all. I trust you believe that this morning. The Antichrist will leave the world with two choices, receive me or die. Jesus Christ, from his word, lays out the gospel, and he lays it before your lap, and he says there are two choices. Receive me as Savior. Receive life forever and abundant joy and grace and mercy at the cross or die in your sins separated for all eternity under the judgment of God it is no different he offers a solution of love the antichrist and his forces offer a solution of destruction you and I have, have a choice as to who we will receive I trust Jesus Christ is your savior this morning that you are committed to following after him no matter the cost love him it will be worth it all Thank you for joining us. We haven't answered all your questions. We're going to look at it more. But it's just a, it's just a, a surface look 
at the ministry of the Antichrist, who he is, how terrible he will be, and yet Jesus Christ is over all, will overcome and overwhelm the Antichrist, will defeat him in the same way he can defeat and has defeated sin. He has canceled out the effects of sin and death by his work on the cross. May you give your life to him and follow him in love because he's done that for you, I pray. That's our prayer. Thanks again for joining with us. We'll see you next week.